This is the Six Teacher Toolbox episode. I hear from listeners all the time that they like the actionable tips and suggestions that they can use right away with their students, either next week or even tomorrow. Now, that usually means effective and beneficial, but also somewhat minimal prep. And that's what I bring you in these Teacher Toolbox episodes. So I have a lot to share, so let's jump in. Are you a language teacher looking for some reassurance that what you're doing in the classroom is on the right track? Or maybe you're looking for some ways to teach even more effectively. If you're one or the other or somewhere in between, you've landed in the right place. This is the World Language Classroom Podcast with your host, me, Joshua Cabral. You're about to get tips, tools, and resources so that your students continue to rise in proficiency and communicate with confidence. Let's jump in. Vamos, allons-y. Hello, my friends. Bonjour, mes amis. Hola, mis amigos. Welcome to the World Language Classroom Podcast. I am Joshua Cabral, and thank you, as always, for taking the time out of your week to listen to this podcast about language teaching. It's just one of the many things that makes you an incredible educator, and I just like to always start by reminding you that look at what you are doing right now. So thank you very much for spending this time with me. So on this episode, which is a teacher toolbox episode, I always bring you activities that you can use right away in your classroom and different procedures and things that are just actionable that you can do right away. Now, what I want to do in particular on this episode is take four different activities that we have talked about on the podcast. Either I've talked about them personally or I've had a guest that's talked about them. But what I want to do today is do a framework where you can take these four activities and use them in conjunction with each other sort of as a holistic procedure, because what often happens on the podcast is you will get a good idea for your classroom, and it is something you could do right away or find a particular unit or something sparks an interest that you hear me talk about or I have a conversation with a guest, but it's always this idea of, is it a one-off? Is that one particular activity I can do just that one time? How does it connect to everything else? So what I want to do today is take four activities that we've talked about and put it together in what will be either a single lesson, which could happen, or a unit where you can use them all together. And this is a little bit of a taste of what the workshops are like that I do when I go into schools or when I'm presenting at conferences, is it's an opportunity to sort of provide a framework for you so that you can implement it in your classroom, taking different activities and then putting them together in a way that works rather than just having all these one-off types of things. So you'll get a bit of a taste of that today. And one thing that you have heard me say on the podcast before is I like to think of teachers, particularly language teachers, that's what we are, as curators, sort of curators like in a museum. Because sometimes we'll say, oh, I stole this idea from someone or, you know, this isn't my idea, it belongs to someone else. And all that different language is almost apologetic for what we're doing in the classroom. And so I like to kind of put that language aside a little bit and refer to us as curators. And like a curator in a museum, they do not create the art. You know, those are other artists that are doing that, but they have an eye for taking the different pieces of art and putting it together and creating an experience for the person visiting and looking at that exposition of art. And so that's why I like to use that for us as teachers as we are finding these different ideas. Maybe we're hearing something on a podcast or at a conference or something like that, and we are able to take those ideas and put them together and create an experience for our students. Sometimes we are creating those individual activities from scratch, and that's wonderful. We're all creative and we can do that. But there are also those times when we're going to hear an idea somewhere else. That's the whole reason for this podcast. And you're going to hear some ideas and you can bring it into your classroom. So you are a curator of these experiences for your students. So let's do away with all that. Oh, this is somebody else's idea. I always want to credit people. Absolutely. I'm not saying don't credit. But in the end, what we are doing is we are taking these ideas and it is our creativity and expertise that is able to craft it into 
into the experience for our students. So that's what I want to do today is take four activities that we've talked about and curate it into an experience for students that you could use in your classroom. So each of these individual activities or procedures have been discussed on a podcast episode, again, either by me, I did it alone, or I had a conversation with a guest who talked about it. So I will briefly touch upon what each of these procedures or activities are, and then connect them together. But you may want to go back and listen to those individual episodes. So I will be sure to mention what those episodes were, where we did the deep dive into these individual procedures or activities. And I will also put the link to each of those individual individual activities in the show notes if you would like to go back and re-listen or listen for the first time. So we're going to start with a write and discuss. I personally learned about a write and discuss for the first time from Ben Fisher Rodriguez, and he was my guest back on episode 79 last year. A write and discuss is a process where after you have read something as a class, had a discussion as a class, watch a video, you somehow engaged with content or language for an extended period of time, either over a class or two, but it's either in reading, something you watched, uh, looking at an infographic, but something where you interacted with language as a class or a content topic as a class. And then following that, a write and discuss is this process of collaboratively writing a summary, essentially, of all of the ideas that have come up, and you are creating this text together. Now, when I do this, I write the paragraph or paragraphs on the board, and I have the students copy them as we are writing. You could also do it digitally. There are lots of different ways, but essentially, you just want to have this experience where you are collectively creating a written summary of the content that you've been working with. And this is collectively written, which means that the ideas come from the students. So you're questioning the students, you're asking them what are the next details we should put in the paragraph, what's important here. So they are offering the language. Now in the end, as the teacher, you are co-creating with them, which means that the sentence that you are writing is going to be the accurate language. So the ideas and concepts are coming from the students, and they may present it in somewhat inaccurate language, but enough to be understood, which is excellent. That's what we want. But then what you as the teacher are creating with the input from students is more accurate language that has that cohesive whole in the paragraph at the end. So that is the whole idea of what a write and discuss is. So because it's co-created, the students are providing the input, they're providing the details based on all of the language activities that you've done and all the engagement you've done. And so once you have that, in the end, you have a very comprehensible text. So even if initially the text you were reading or something you were listening to was at a more challenging linguistic level for students, what you are creating in the end is based on the student's language and what they're able to provide, and you are putting it together in a very comprehensible text. So now students can engage with it that is more aptly at their proficiency level. So that's what the whole idea of a write and discuss is, and that could be an activity on its own and a way to bring together the understanding of some sort of text that you've listened to or read or discussed, and then students have this, and you can then use it for other activities. So that is the starting point for this particular unit frame that I'll be talking about. So you can start with a write and discuss, and again, that That was on episode 79. If you want to go through the details of exactly how to do it with uh, Ben Fisher Rodriguez, you can listen to that whole episode. The link is in the show notes. But having this co-constructed text, which is generated by the students, but honed in on by you, the teacher, is a great foundation for then subsequent follow-up activities. So having that, and I'm going to actually talk to you about how I've actually used it, but you could use other activities that we've talked about on the podcast or your own to follow up on them. But what I have then done is I take this co-constructed text, which again is very comprehensible for students because they've had their 
whole part in creating it. So then following up, whether in that class, the next class, this go over a week, is I would do a parallel text. And now we talked about parallel text on episode 90 with Caitlin Leppert. And we talked all about this process of using parallel text in the classroom. So that was episode 90. So if you want to listen to that whole episode, the link is in the show notes. But the idea of a parallel text is where you take a text that's comprehensible to students, and it's great to use a write and discuss text because again, they contributed to it and it's language they understand and details they're aware of. So you take that and then you swap out details so that students can engage with the text. So you may take out if there was a character analysis that you were talking about or details about how to do something. So then what you do is you take out some of the details and then you have students fill in their own personal details, their own personal thoughts on it. So for example, if it was a very descriptive text, you could take out all of the adjectives and then students would re-engage with the text and fill in new adjectives to go along with the entire text and fill it in. And then in the end, each student is actually going to have a different individual text because they contributed their own adjectives to it. Or maybe you take all the nouns out or you take specific details out that you had talked about a character in a story you were reading and you can swap it out and take out all the details about the character, keep the general structure there and have students add in other details there about their, say their age, what they look like, their appearance, something like that, where they live, what they do, personality characteristics, anything like that, have them change it in with all other different information. And then in the end, you have an entirely different character. Granted, it's not the one from the story, but students are able to engage with it. And it gets a little more metalinguistic where they're using specific adjectives and understanding what adjectives are, and also making sure they're in the correct form if adjectives change form in the language that you teach. So again, it's taking that write and discuss text that you have created, co-created together, and then students then use that as a frame and you create a parallel text. So that's why it's called a parallel text because it's essentially the same frame of what you wrote, but students are changing out details in there. So again, if you want to do a deep dive into doing a parallel text, which can be any text, it doesn't have to be based on your write and discuss. It can be any text, but if you would like to do a deep dive into doing a parallel text that was on episode 90 with Caitlin Leppert, and you can learn all the details and structures and procedures and lots more ideas for doing it on there. So another follow-up activity to the write and discuss, this doesn't necessarily have to be after you've done a parallel text. It could be instead of a parallel text, but just another idea of what you can do once you have that co-constructed text with students is now I would use that for some grammar study within the context. And this is a great use of the PACE model. Now, the PACE model is a way of teaching grammar in context. So the PACE model is an acronym, P-A-C-E. So it stands for presentation, attention, co-construction, and extension. And as you are looking at a text that students fully understand for the most part, it's kind of comprehensible input, but a, a text that is generally very understood by students, and then you highlight certain structures in there, and students try to figure out the patterns, and you help to co-construct what that grammar rule would be based on how it is in the text. So that's what the whole idea of a pace is. So you present a text, students understand it, and then you draw their attention attention, perhaps by highlighting certain structures, and then students try to find the patterns and you help them to co-construct what that grammar rule is that they're seeing in there, or that grammar pattern rather. And then once they think they've figured it out, you have them do an extension activity where they create it on their own, something using that example of that pattern. So that's what a PACE lesson is, and it's a little more involved in that. So if you want to do that deep dive into teaching grammar in context, uh, the first episode to listen to is the one that I did with Mike Travers, which was all about grammar as a concept and in context. And that was in the way back machine of episode nine. So that was well over 120 episodes ago early on uh, when I first started the podcast and I knew everybody wanted to talk about grammar. So we've talked about it on a lot of episodes since, but specifically the pace model 
is on episode nine, and the link is in the show notes. So what you can do is once you have this co-constructed text that you've done through a write and discuss, you can then highlight certain parts of it. Maybe it's verb forms, if everything's in the third person and it's about one person, and you have a language where the verbs are conjugated depending on the subject pronoun, you can just highlight all the endings of the verbs and then highlight the subject pronouns or who's being discussed. Or you have a lot of adjectives in there, and you can highlight where the nouns are and the adjectives are, and students are finding the pattern of where the adjectives are in relation to the noun, or perhaps the form of the adjective if you're teaching a language that changes the adjective form based on the noun that it's modifying. So any kind of structure that's in there. But the thing is, is that you're starting by this presentation of the text where the students understand it. And I really like the idea of leveraging a write and discuss text because students truly understand it because they provided all the content already. So it's a great starting point. And as you are writing out that paragraph and co-constructing it with them, you can make sure to put in particular grammar points or grammar structures so that there is a pattern in there that students can then find. Because a lot of times when we're looking at authentic resources and finding patterns that are directly related to the pattern we want students to find can be challenging. But when we are co-constructing that write and discuss paragraph, we can actually make sure that we are putting those grammar structures in there that we want students to notice after. So using the PACE model uh, with our co-constructed text is a really useful extension and it keeps it in context for students. So a third additional activity that you can do that uses the concepts that are coming up in your write and discuss is to do a guided conversation for oral practice. Because a lot of what we've been doing has been focused on presentational writing or maybe some interpretive reading. But now to have some oral practice with the language, we can do guided conversations. And on episode 117, I spoke with Jamie Rodriguez and we talked all about using guided conversations in the language classroom. So again, that link is in the show notes. So a guided conversation is a scaffolded guided conversation using that content from your co-constructed text. So if you have students that are a much more advanced proficiency level, intermediate, mid to high, they can have conversations without a lot of scaffolding a lot of their interpersonal but when it comes to our novice or lower intermediate students that having this idea of a guided conversation is much more helpful to help them engage in the conversation so essentially the way a guided conversation works is you have person a and person b that are in the conversation so you start with person a's prompt and then what person b will do with that prompt so the first one for Person A will be ask a question about what the character looks like. So you'll have a text where you've talked about what the character looks like. And then person B will respond to person A's question. Now, they don't know what person A's question is, and the language isn't there. So the student that is A, they're just being told, ask that question, but they are given this guide of how to have the conversation, but not being given the actual question. They have to create it on their own. So you may or may not even put the prompt in the target language, whether or not you want to actually scaffold and help them with the question. So person A asks that question, and then person B responds to that question. Then it goes back to person A, and the prompt now is ask a follow-up question based on the information that person B gave in their answer. And then you just keep going through the conversation that way. So what it's doing is it's guiding students in how to have a conversation without necessarily giving them the language or having a memorized dialogue, but they are engaging in the text that you've co-created together. That's where all the details are. Because a lot of times when we're having students have interpersonal conversations, we're expecting them to create create a lot of ideas along with the language. But this idea of a guided conversation based on a text they really understand, they don't have to create the details. They're more focused on creating with the language. And again, when you say ask a question about what they look like, the student can do 
whatever they want with the language there. They might ask a yes or no question if that's where they're at. But then the answer to the question is going to have another question on top of it. And they don't know what that language is going to be. So it's not really a strict conversation where they're memorizing a dialogue. It's really guiding them in how to have a conversation. So an example of putting this all together is, say we start, for example, you're using a CI reader in your classroom. You have a 15 to 20 chapter book, you're doing this with an intermediate low class. And after each, maybe say two or three chapters, you do a chapter summary together. And again, I'm giving you an exact example of how I have personally done this. So after say the first two chapters, or after chapter three and four, you could do this every couple of chapters, you do a chapter summary where students are providing details, and you are writing on the board or digitally that summary paragraph or two paragraphs as you do the write and discuss. And then after that, I take it and we do a parallel text where I will change out some of the details depending on what the chapter was about. Maybe they went somewhere and they did certain activities. So we'll change out all the activities and they create sort of what looks like a parallel chapter of other things they could have done in that place. And then you can do a pace activity where you're doing the presentation, attention, and then the co-construction and the extension activity where you're focusing on a particular grammar structure that comes up in the text. And sometimes I've actually done this where it'll all be in the present tense. So then I'll say, let's say this all happened yesterday. And so when I put it in, I change it out and I make sure that as we're going through, I'm putting all the verbs in the past. Now, students perhaps haven't seen this or had much experience with it before, but as they're going through, they can start to see what those patterns are. But again, they understand the whole text, and that's the point of doing a pace. And then after that, a guided conversation where you can have them be actual characters in the story that you're reading. So you are person A, whatever, a name them one of the characters. You're asking the person B, another character in the story, a question about something or their opinion on something, and then following up the conversation going through that way. So if you're using a CI reader, it's something you can do every two chapters, three chapters, or maybe even after the whole book. But you're co-constructing the text and then doing that parallel text where you're swapping out details and then using the text to focus in on a grammar pattern using pace. And then you can do a guided conversation where you're using the details to engage orally with the story. So there you have this way of taking four different activities that we have talked about and how you can use them collectively within either a lesson or a unit and so that we can start to look at the activities that we're doing as not a one-off, but they can be used together. And a lot of these are so versatile. You can do just a write and discuss. You can do just the parallel text or a pace model or guided conversations and fit it into whatever unit you're doing. But I wanted to give you this way of taking them and having a framework of doing them all together so that they don't have to be a, just a one-off. But in the end, we just want to make sure that we are as student-centered as possible, and doing a write and discuss does rely on the student's input, although the teacher is helping to co-construct. But as you're going through, that you're giving students more opportunities to engage on their own. So be sure to check out the show notes where you'll see the links to those four specific episodes if you want to dive deeper. So there was episode nine about teaching grammar and concept with Mike Travers, episode 79, which is doing a write and discuss with Ben Fisher Rodriguez. And then there was episode 90 about parallel texts with Caitlin Leppert. And then episode 117 was guided conversations in the language classroom with Jamie Rodriguez. So you'll also see in the show notes that there is a link for Talking Points, my weekly email newsletter with tips and resources for language teaching. And there are also links to get in touch with me if you'd like to work together, either in person in your school or we can do it remotely. And you got a little bit of a sense today of how we use frameworks within my workshops to bring the activities together so they're not all one-offs. But that is how that would work out. So thank you so much for spending this time with me today. I will talk to you soon. Bye for now.
Thank you for listening to the World Language Classroom podcast. Be sure to follow or subscribe wherever you're listening so that you never miss an episode. Let's keep the conversation going on social media. Connect with me on X, aka Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at WL Classroom. And for even more valuable resources, visit my website, wlclassroom.com, where you'll find over 300 blog posts about language teaching. So stay inspired, keep growing, and continue making a difference in your language classroom.